now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're hailing from. Welcome to another special KubeCon EU 2021 edition office hours. Today, I am joined by members of the wonderful OKD community. I would like to thank all of you for joining today, and I'm actually going to have to probably turn my video off at some point so that all of you can fit in the screen if you end up sharing anything on screen. So thank you very much uh, for joining and watching. I'm going to hand it over to Josh real quick to run about introductions, and Josh, take it yep. away. Thank you. And I'm here welcoming the OKD Working Group, our community for OKD, um, the most exciting distribution of Kubernetes. Um, and uh, let me introduce the members of our community here. Uh, and we will start with Diane. Diane, you want to Hi, say everybody. a um, about you and, and... Yes, sure. Um, we'll, we'll, as we all um, are recouping from a late early morning or whatever you were at KubeCon, um, welcome all. Um, I'm Diane Mueller. I'm one of the co-chairs of the OKD Working Group. I'm also the director of um, uh, community development at Red Hat and OKD is one of my um, favorite things on the universe. And um, I'm really pleased here to have today a number of folks from the OKD working group so that I don't have to talk too much. Um, and most of them um, have had uh, production, home lab, uh, all kinds of different um, approaches to deploying OKD. So please pepper them all with your questions. Um, there's lots of good um, experience here with OKD. Um, and I'll hand it over to Charo, maybe now. Hey everyone, Charo Groover, a uh, recent new hire to Red Hat, actually been with the company for, uh, oh goodness, about nine months now. Uh, August will be my one year anniversary. Uh, so I've transitioned from being a 20 year customer of Red Hat products to now being on the other side of that fence and subjecting other customers to these wonderful products. I've uh, been using uh, OKD since the 3.x days. Um, actually used it uh, in lab settings as well as in development and experiment environments that, that eventually led um, the company that, that I was employed by from becoming a, uh, an OCP, an OpenShift customer. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about seeing the journey that a lot of you are taking with this sort of upstream side stream project that is my favorite Kubernetes distribution by far. And I'll hand it over to Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie McGarrow. I'm a uh, DevOps engineer at the University of Michigan. And I have been uh, utilizing uh, OKD for some time now as a uh, development uh, sandbox for developers at the University of Michigan and have done a lot of work in automating installation of OKD uh, UPI uh, vSphere installations uh, and have done a lot of work in trying to uh, improve the documentation and make it more accessible to folks such as the viewers here who want to embrace OKD. And uh, let me uh, pick now uh, Joseph. Hello, I'm Joseph Meyer. I'm a cloud architect at the company Rodi and Schwarz. Um, it's a German, a Munich located company. We are in a telecom and uh, I'm using OKD since more than three years now. Um, we used it for starting our digital business journey. Um, we used a lot of uh, distributions before OKD. And yes, OKD was, was our favorite ones uh, in our evaluation phase. We are using it for our um, development um, engineers. And also we use it in production. Currently, a few hundred uh, developers are on it. And uh, it has great potential for us. It, yeah, we, I love it a lot. And I worked, uh, I work with the, together with the OKD working group, I think since more than one and a half year now uh, in yeah, fixing bugs, testing, testing a lot in my home lab here, um, mostly on vSphere, but also um, I did uh, a little bit of work for Azure. 
and I select uh, John. Hey, everybody. So my name is John Fortune. I work for a company called Market America. Um, I've been using uh, OKD since it was origin back in the day, probably about 3.4. Uh, we are using it in production, um, uh, currently in 3.11. And since about October and November of last year, we've started to really look at OKD4 um, and starting to do a lot of testing with it. Um, I've been involved quite a bit with uh, the testing on vSphere, especially IPI, uh, bug smashing, squishing, um, you know, trying to get uh, OKD4 to be uh, as stable as we can possibly get it for the, the vast amount of people. So it's been a lot of fun. I, uh, I'm really enjoying this community. And let's see, who's left? Timothy. Timothy. Hey, so hi, I'm, I'm Timothy Ravier and I work uh, in the Corus team uh, as a software engineer at Red Hat. And essentially I do a lot of the work uh, on Federal Corus that's needed to move the, the OS forward. And that's mostly it for me. And for folks that don't know, Fedora Core OS is the underlying <laughs> operating system that uh, the nodes of OKD uh, utilize. Yeah, and I think we actually need to start out because we're having this during KubeCon. We have some people who are completely new to OKD. Mm -hmm. um, so does somebody want to take on the usual question, which is, what is OKD? Why, yes, I think we do. And in fact, we've got some material to share on that. So without further ado, uh, let me share my screen. All right, you guys should be seeing an OKD working group office hour slide. Give me a thumbs up. All right, okay, so what is OKD? Um, that's what we're going to talk about here. We're going to give a quick overview, um, give you a quick update on current state, where we are, um, talk a bit, but not a lot, because we'll save it for some of your Q&A, about what, what differentiates uh, OKD and OpenShift uh, from some other Kubernetes distributions, and um, finally give you some info on how you can connect with the working groups, both the OKD working group and our Fedora Core OS uh, working group. So OKD, it is a community distribution of Kubernetes, uh, end of story, that it is a distribution of Kubernetes. So it is 100% Kubernetes, right? This is not a fork of Kubernetes or something slightly different. This is all Kubernetes. Um, that, that's a question that we get from time to time. It is also OpenShift. So, so any of you that might be um, Red Hat subscribers to OCP, the OpenShift container platform, uh, the code base of, of OKD is the exact same code base as OpenShift. The difference is that where OCP is sitting on Red Hat Core OS as its underlying operating system, we have an upstream component of our OpenShift distribution that is Fedora Core OS. So what does this provide for you? Well, you know, it, it is a Kubernetes distribution like we described, but we also sort of refer to it as a, a Kubernetes plus plus because it automates a lot of the installation, the patching and the updates from the operating system up. So once you have your OpenShift uh, cluster up and running, it is going to take care of itself to a great extent. You, you can have zero downtime um, updates, um, although uh, a lot of us tend to, to cross our fingers when we're doing the updates, especially since we're running upstream. But by and large, the, the updates are a, a very pleasurable experience, uh, except on those rare occasions when they aren't. Uh, and like other Kubernetes distributions, it enables you to run cloud native applications from a host of 
programming languages, platforms, the, the technologies that you would expect to run in a cloud platform without locking you into a specific cloud provider. So whether you want to run on your own metal, you want to run on Overt or OpenStack or VMware or AWS or Azure or GCP or a host of cloud providers, your applications will run the same because they're running on the same Kubernetes platform. So the state of where we're at right now is version 4.7. So, so we are at parity with our um, subscription-based uh, OCP. Uh, 4.8 is going to introduce some exciting new capabilities that we're all looking forward to, to trying out in our labs uh, coming up here pretty soon. Uh, one of the ones that I'm most excited about is going to be bootstrapless single node clusters. Um, any of you that, that have um, worked with deploying an OpenShift cluster at this point, um, you know, from one of our OKD projects, uh, you, you know that, that one of the first things that has to start up is a bootstrap node that exists only as long as it takes to, to get the cluster up and running. Well, for single node clusters with 4.8, they are going to be able to bootstrap themselves. Um, I don't know if any of us have experimented with that yet. I know that I have not. I hope too soon. But that's something I'm really excited about. We're also getting a lot more collaboration now, um, really starting in our 4.6 release, but it's accelerating in our 4.7 release with a lot of the providers, the operators that you find in Operator Hub. So more and more of the operators that are available in the subscription-based product uh, are now showing up as their upstream counterparts in our Operator Hub. Uh, there are also providers that are uh, starting to create uh, new operators, bespoke operators for OKD. And, and this is giving us an opportunity to, to really enable um, adoption of up, upcoming and newer technologies. Like I'm in, in my own home lab, I'm running uh, upstream versions of Ceph for my storage provider for as a Tecton so that I can get a feel for, you know, new things that are going to be available in OpenShift pipelines or OpenShift container storage as they come along. I'm going to talk for just a minute about the operator pattern, because this is one of the things that, that really differentiates OKD from other Kubernetes distributions, is that from the bottom up, OKD is based on operators. The very first thing that starts running on that bootstrap node to get a cluster up and running is an operator. Operators manage the entire ecosystem. Operators um, control the updates. They control the versioning. They control and maintain the health of your cluster. So from the, the, the cluster version operator, which is the thing that is controlling all of your top level, all the way down to managing the underlying operating system, the version of Fedora Core OS that is running on your nodes. Those are all operators, uh, which makes the care and feeding and maintenance of one of these clusters um, much easier than uh, what you may have experienced in a more traditional Kubernetes environment. And again, like I said, Operator Hub is the place to get just about anything you want to run in your cluster. And as we continue to work with our uh, companion projects that provide the operators for uh, the OCP platform, you'll see more and more uh, Red Hat official operators showing up in the Operator Hub, as well as a host of community provided operators. Finally, I'm going to introduce you to uh, our working groups so that you can connect online with this very active and very excited group of individuals. We'd love for you to come and join us. 
I'm going to leave this screen up for just a little bit so you can screenshot it or snap it or whatever. Uh, this is our, our Slack channels, our Google group. Um, we have biweekly meetings that you can find at that Fedora project uh, calendar site. And we maintain a couple of repositories uh, that uh, we track our issues and features and, and things of that nature in. Fedora Core OS, uh, by the same token, and I'll leave this slide up for a, a few seconds uh, again, has a very active community. Uh, and Timothy is here with us today. So if there are any Fedora Core OS specific questions, he is the man to answer those for you. Here are a few more resources that you can grab. I'll leave this up for a few seconds for any screenshots. And because this is an office hour and not a slide presentation, I talked very fast and blew through these slides. So let's get to the office hour and answer your questions. Thanks, everybody. OK, so we have questions all over the map um, from both existing OKD users and from uh, uh, folks who are looking at it uh, because of this. Um, one of the first ones that came in here was from Sanjay, um, who is interested in using DNS mask um, I, as a service or something else for caching DNS inside OKD. Um, and uh, wants to know if there's anybody's experience with that, if somebody has put up a how-to somewhere. Thoughts? That one may be a dumper. I I have not um, I have not attempted to do anything with that yet. I'd be interested if if he could type it in asynchronously and what the specific use case is, what the need is for a DNS cache. Because um, I, I haven't personally in my lab or, or even in the production OCP clusters that, I, that I've worked with come across a scenario where the native DNS provider of the cluster itself um, wasn't sufficient. Okay, I've asked him to expand on his use case. Um, so we've got some other more sort of basic questions about installation. Um, one was somebody who wants to try out OKD um, and they're having some issues with the installation being complicated. Um, earlier you talked about the bootstrapless um, installation that's coming. Is that, is that sort of your main, our main installation simplification effort? It, you know, it's the beginning. It, it's the beginning of it right now. If you're installing OKD on one of the major cloud providers, um, and, and this is true for OKD and OCP, um, the OpenShift installer itself uh, is able to natively communicate with that cloud provider. Um, the I, I'm going to I'm going to speculate that the individual asking the question is probably doing a user provisioned infrastructure install, what we call a UPI install, and, mm -hmm. and those those are um, somewhat more complex because they require uh, some upfront configuration of you know DNS providers, networks, uh, things of that nature that that are you know that that add complexities rather than just running OpenShift install and then answering a few menu questions and watching your cluster grow in AWS or, or GCP or Azure. Yeah, well, that was, yeah oh, Jamie, ahead, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, you know where I'm going. So uh, we have a uh, off the website, uh, if you go to okd.io, there's a link to a, a series of guides that cover AWS, Azure, GCP, Home Lab, Single Node, vSphere. And these are guides for um, UPI, a lot of UPI, some IPI, um, for installing OKD uh, on these platforms. And so that um, is a great place to start if you're running into issues. Um, check it out because there's a lot of the sort of the nuanced detail that you might not find in, in the um, uh, the standard documentation, standard OKD documentation. And it provides some uh, background on prerequisites 
for example, that's really helpful, I think. Uh, and in the case of the vSphere UPI, I've actually got a repository with a script that does the whole process for you pretty much after you set a couple of variables. Um, yeah, well, so, one of the... uh, yeah, go ahead, Chuck. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jamie. Yeah, one of the things that I love about this group is that we're all lab enthusiasts but we're all running in different types of environments. So, so there, is, there is somebody in this working group that is running on just about any platform that you can imagine. So I'd say if, if you have installation questions, join us in a working group meeting. Uh, if we can't answer it, we might ask you to figure it out and document it for us. But um, most of us have, have written tutorials and how-to guides and, and things of that nature that, that, as Jamie mentioned, we're collecting together so, so that folks can, can go find uh, a, a, an instructional for installing that is beyond the, the documentation you find online. And I, I would just put a pitch in our next OKD working group is um, next Tuesday at 1700 UTC and it's open to everybody. And if you go to OKD.io, um, you can find the guides in the nav bar and you can also find the information to navigate to all the repos, latest release and everything else. Um, and hopefully find your way to the OKD working group um, forum on Google as well. I put that in the chat earlier. Um, that is a great place to post um, questions as well. And we are really active in the Kubernetes Slack in the OpenShift-Dev channel. So if you get stumped, um, go there. There's usually somebody there. But it is, I'm going to say, community supported. So this is a, not a Red Hat technical support um, supported thing. So, and. The, the good news is it's a really active community. And as you can see by all the folks that are here today, as well as um, we've got great, uh, great collaboration going on with the Fedora CoreOS folks, because I really do want to emphasize OKD runs with um, Fedora CoreOS as opposed to RHEL CoreOS. So it is a very different, we'd like to say sibling um, upstream or sibling stream to OK, uh, OCP. But um, we want to emphasize the community aspect of this one um, and make sure that people are fully aware that it, all your help um, and efforts um, uh, to get support and answers is going to come from the community. We are a group of volunteers. That's right. Hey, one thing I can say with installation is that it, you can make it as you know, easy as you know, a 20 or 30 line configuration file to as complex as you want it to be. Um, I run IPI, so pretty much um, I have a set of conf uh, one configuration file that I can repeat over and over and over again. Um, and if I have to change something, it's just a small tweak. Um, you know, Jamie's is probably a little bit more complicated because of what he does with DHCP and all sorts of other things. But it can be easy or it can be complex, and most cases are going to be in between. Yep, yeah, I'm on the other end questions. of the spectrum <laughs> with, with, with custom ignition files. Yep. <laughs> What else do we have for questions? Well, so speaking of complicated installations, uh, one of the people in chat actually wants to know about air-gapped installations. Do we have uh, a guide for that yet? Okay. Yeah, actually, the, the tutorial that I have for a large cluster actually does cover doing an air-gapped install. It's UPI. Uh, based. Um, Jamie, I don't know in, in, in vSphere or, or Joseph have either. Yeah, there is like Sarah Docs, Sarah Docs for air gapped installations, on, also on vSphere. Yeah. Yeah. So several of us have done, have done air gapped installs, mimicking, you know, a, a, a real data center environment where you, you don't just allow internet access straight out. Okay. Um, so, uh, we here, uh, I take a look at that. And if you have follow up questions, you can ask them later on. Um, the, um, our, our DNS, Sanjay just got back to me. He's basically, he's got services that make heavy use of DNS and he's looking to not overwhelm core DNS, um, in his infrastructure for application mm -hmm. DNS requests. Um, and also maybe get better response times by, I guess, having uh, pods that are local to each node um, doing DNS. And was wondering if anybody has any advice there. Um, related to this, 
since it's a community on chat, user Stefan actually said that they are using um, node local DNS um, uh, on top of vSphere uh, with their cluster. Okay. That, that actually sounds like something some of us would be intrigued about. Mm -hmm. So I would say, please join us in a working group meeting if you can, because I, I think several of us would, would like to experiment with that type of uh, um, scenario. That might be a good topic for the discussion group in the in the GitHub now too. Yeah, it might be a good one to be able to put some stuff in. Yeah, because I'm 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 sure we we could come up with different models to to achieve that. Um, e even you know the DNS mask running in a container that's that's locked to nodes um, is an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, and I guess a lot of it would depend on why it is you want this extra level of DNS, right? Is it because you really really care about lookup response times? Or is it because you're modifying the DNS all the time, right? Because those are two different use cases. Mm -hmm. The um, okay, so that's a your answer, Sanjay. Is please follow up with this on you know the Slack channel or in a GitHub issue or something. People are interested in it. People have different ideas um, and and feedback about different ways to do this. The um, uh, if somebody wants to give Stefan some links again about how to join those forums. Um, other questions, uh, there's some brief things. Um, I, uh, actually, here's an important thing. Also, if somebody can post another link, somebody wanted a link to the, the slide deck. Um, so if somebody can post that in chat. Um, the um, uh, here's one of the other questions, um, which anybody can field really quickly. Um, one of the chronic problems with installing um, upstream Kubernetes using the official Kubernetes testing images is that you often find yourself disabling SE Linux. Um, somebody want to confirm that that is not something that you have to do when you install OKD? That is not something that you have to do when you install OKD. I would second, third, and fourth that. We highly discourage disabling SE Linux or your firewall. Leave your firewall up too. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. The, um, okay, uh, more sort of questions. Um, one of our uh, chat people actually wants to know whether or not there are um, packages or installation scripts more likely uh, for installing it on CentOS stream. Mm. Um, I guess the answer is probably no, because we, we need Fedora Core OS, yeah? Uh, if, if they mean that their underlying hypervisor provider is CentOS stream, um, I just updated my lab environment to CentOS stream. The operating system of OKD though is Fedora Core OS, uh, and right. and we don't we don't support any other operating systems currently other than Fedora Core OS running on the master nodes and the compute nodes. Yeah, okay. so basically, the, just to give a little bit of background on that, there's a, a machine configuration operator and different parts of OKD that talk directly to the OS and and manage the updates, um, and uh, they're pretty tied to each other. Um, and so there's more documentation on that on our website, but, um, if you want more nuanced detail on sort of how they're all connected, feel free to, to pop into the channels or look over the document. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, Red Hat folks, I believe even on the, the, the subscription based side for OCP, we, we are moving away from, um, it, it, supporting non core OS nodes as well. I, I know we, we used to support run, rail nodes for compute nodes, um, but I think we're even getting away from that. I still think you can use rail for worker nodes now. You can, you can now. Yeah. Yeah. But whether or not that stays, I don't know. You, you can for now, but the, for sure the, the main I mean, once we want for the master node, at least we we enforce with that core S, and that's the, the priority, the the one we're putting the most focus on. So, a couple other things. One thing is, I love these community things. I just I want to call out 
we had a question in here and another community answer answered it, right? Which was somebody asking, is there a way to install OKD on Poxmox as a virtualization platform? Mm, and also, someone else actually jumped in in the chat and said they've already done that. So yeah. yes. had, um, it was my first installation. On this channel doing just that. Yeah. Cool. It was my first installation for OKD and it works uh, pretty good also yeah. on Proxmox. Cool. Okay. Um, here's a more uh, technical question, um, which I'm going to read out directly because I don't want to get it wrong, uh, which is, uh, Niels wants to know, is the OKD IPI process the same as the OCP IPI process? Um, they're using OKD IPI as a test platform um, to test a migration from UPI to IPI installations um, uh, on vSphere. Um, and they want to know when they do this in production, can they use the same process for OCP? Yeah, um, I've done both. So I, I took my configuration file for uh, OKD and with a couple of very small tweaks to make sure I was pointing at the OCP stuff, worked like a charm. Okay. I think you can even cool. use the same, well, I don't know. I used I used the the OCP installer and the OKD installer. I'm not sure if you can switch those out and have them installed, but the process itself is the same, in my experience. Okay. The um, it's not really a question. Which one are you looking at? Well, actually, some of it, um, I'm going to rephrase this because it's, you know. Um, Go for it. <laughs> I don't want to trash talk anybody, but the um, <laughs> one of the things is, so one of the questions, right, is would OKD effectively be comparable to Rancher in terms of, of when somebody is looking at use cases? Hmm. I will admit I haven't used Rancher. I think I, yeah. I think uh, OpenShift is or OKD is more opinionated than Rancher, but you at Rancher you have to take care about more things. So that's always a trade-off. Yeah, Rancher has a special you can yeah. install you you can yeah, install Rancher anything you want on, on OpenShift or OKD. You can Install anything you want on both, but um, in an opinion, opinionated distribution, you have to take care about less stuff. Yeah, somebody mentioned um, the amount of uh, resources needed to run OKD. I think that once we get to that single node OKD uh, for people to use, um, you know, you'll find testing wise, we'll be able to do a lot more for a straight install of OKD, you know, even for testing, it's still fairly beefy. You have to have fairly beefy nodes. So that's one of the things you have to keep in mind with whatever distribution you decide to use is do you have the utilization or the resources, you know, to be able to run it? Yeah, the, the trade off there is that, you know, the all of the automation and self healing that comes with OKD, right? That does require compute. And, and so, so OKD is uh, a bit fatter from its resource requirements than, you know, a, a plain vanilla Kubernetes or, or another container supporting platform. But the, 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 the trade-off is a self-managing environment that, that really gives you a cloud native experience in my opinion. Absolutely, which is one of the reasons why we chose it. I don't have time to manage, you know, every five minutes, you know, the, the cluster. Um, I can turn over a lot of stuff to my developers. They get a lot of authority to do things within their projects, and I don't have to manage it. They can manage it themselves. Um, that's one of the things I just love about OpenShift and, you know, OKD. Yeah. Don't forget would, the web UI. Yeah, and I would echo that. I think that, you know, from the... DevOps perspective, that sort of OKD and OpenShift provide uh, that sort of middle layer that's really good. If you look at some of the other container orchestration 
uh, options out there. They in involve a lot of glue scripts and stuff that you have to bring to the table. And I think OKD provides a lot of that uh, and makes it very easy for developers to sort of slide in to the role of, uh, of a container developer and, and DevOps. So it's really good, I think, for that transition uh, of uh, getting developers into DevOps uh, and for sysadmining it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and with the maturity now of projects like Rook, Ceph, and um, Cubevert, you know, which which also have productized um, versions that you know that you can get subscription support for. I, I mean, my goodness, you you have a full hyper converged cloud native environment that that can replace most of what you find in a data center. I'm a bit of a fan. <laughs> um, a strong a strong point we have with WorkID is that so that's my Fedora Chorus hat on uh, is that we test the full OS, the full everything that comes with the OS, with everything in the OKD platform. So what you get is when you update from one version to another of OKD, you get a platform which has been fully tested end to end, uh, the OS and everything on top of it, and you practically sure that everything works together, which is like something that only happens in OKD and OCP platforms. Cool. Um, and, and as long as you're unmuted, Timothy, uh, there is actually a question specifically to you. Somebody is actually looking for a primer on how RPM OS3 works. Hmm. Sure. So RPM OS3, it's, it's um, the, component, the main component of uh, Fedora Chorus Node, and that helps us manage versions of the node. So when you update your OKD cluster, you update all the components of the Kubernetes components, and you also update the nodes at the same time. And to do that, you use RPM OS3. And what it does is essentially RPM OS3 is a git way to manage your operating system. So you move from one version of the other of, of your Fedora Chorus node, uh, and uh, you, you just pull a new image and, and you essentially reboot to it. Uh, to update and so that has a lot of advantages so that the first one is that we actually test all of those images we have several stream in Fedora Crest and we make sure that they work uh, and then the second one is that every uh, single update you do on your system is atomic and it just either happen or does not happen at all so you just update into the new version and that's it you're done so you got progressive rolling updates on your cluster to make sure that you're always up to date uh, with the latest version of the nodes. Cool. Um, speaking of latest versions, um, uh, somebody wants to deploy an OKD cluster using Reddit using Advanced Cluster Manager. Now we we just had the <laughs> OCM office hour an hour ago, so I actually know something about this now, but. Um, does anybody anybody have firsthand knowledge? Not yet. I, I, I will say to stay tuned, um, unless some of you guys have, have used it a bit, because um, I do now have two clusters running in my lab that I'm going to put ACM in front of, um, but I haven't gotten there yet. So in a few more weeks, I'll have an opinion. And I think ACM is also one of the operators um, that will be available also for OKD um, soon. They, they promised to make it available for OKD. ACM or OCM? OCM is the upstream. Um, OCM yeah. is coming. I don't know how it, is, how, how it will be called, but yes, it's upstream. Yeah. Okay. OCM is the upstream project of ACM, for those of you who don't know, and it's we're open sourcing all of that and you can find it. And we, what I think this is a great topic for in maybe a future office hour um, to demo this bit because um, the, the folks from the OCM team um, have been reaching out to the OKD teams um, and uh, would like some airtime too. So I think there's going to be a, a nice bit of collaboration there. Yeah, we might, right. we might wait on that until 100% of it is working though. Minor detail. It's the, um, we, never, we never do that in OK. Never do that. <laughs> yep. I think one of the things okay, I would I... say is that the benefit of the OKD working group is we are on the bleeding edge and we 
test all of this stuff for people. So mm -hmm. if you have a new project or a new operator and you want it tested, come to the OKD working group because we, are, we love being guinea pigs. Maybe not for some of your production environments, guys, but um, I know that's one of the things that, that's really useful, the upstream um, open source side of o OpenShift is to get stuff tested over by the OKD working group. And we do bleed and to, on occasion. <laughs> and to test experimental stuff, like somebody actually wants to know suggestions for edge load balancers um, that people are using with OKD. Mm. I'm going to be quiet, but I can't. Um, there is um, a, a whole SIG around edge and working groups. Um, reach out on the OKD um, forum um, in, the, in the Google group and post that question, and we will find the person who has the answer to that. Um, I don't think anybody here has really done that, but we have talked about edgy stuff, um, edge-related stuff, and ARM, as well as ARM stuff in the OKD working group. So there are people who are covering those topics, just not here today. Okay. Yeah, I know there's quite a few folks using like metal LB. Yeah. Yeah, um, which is still a relatively new project. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of those things we should be doing more sessions about um, so that people know how to use it. I don't know how to use it. I'd like to do a session for that reason. Um, let's see, a few things. Um, somebody's actually looking for best practices information uh, particularly when installing on bare metal um, in terms of what they need and how to configure it. You so know, if you go to, oh. Go yeah. ahead, no, go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, so there's, so uh, best practices, I think can probably be construed from the guides that we have um, and the documentation. We've actually tried to do, although, there's a lot of variety in UPI uh, and in bare metal uh, in general. Uh, the guides actually have a, a, some good practices outlined that basically you could determine best practices from those. Um, so we probably need a little more um, uh, discussion with that person to get a sense of their environment if they popped into the channel or something like that. But you know, um, the guides are a good place to start, yeah. One of the things that I think to pay attention to is the recommendations for memory and CPU on, on your services. Um, some people will try to run less. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Um, those are probably uh, the best way to start is, you know, is with those as your minimum requirement. Once you get it close to working, you want to try something else, you know, go ahead, but, you know, start with, with the minimum requirements and go from there. Yeah. That and avoid spinning disks for your master nodes. Yes. It, it CD that is a, a, <laughs> not like disk latency. No, like oh. there's, there's a whole article that uh, talks about that IBM put out mm. I'll grab a link to it real quick, but oh, that's a although, very salient point. Oh, come on. I used to run a demo with etcd running <laughs> off of five USB keys. Ooh. You could do two, maybe even three writes a minute. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Your cluster's going to be just fine. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the, on your um, CK modem? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, listen, um, one of the areas I used to consult was actually, you know, Department of Energy, Power Generation, et cetera. Um, and the onboard computers they have on power equipment, uh, all of these are actually real hardware constraints, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, but we have questions from the audience actually on specific features. They're features that like, they know from OCP and the supported versions. Um, they want to know what the equivalents are in OKD. Um, one of them is um, container native virtualization. Um, so the, the OpenShift virtualization feature and the other one is service mesh. Um, so what do those look like on OKD? Service mesh, I believe the operator is in operator hub now for service mesh. Really? Okay. I think I'm looking, I'm looking real fast to see if um, because the last time I installed both Service Mesh and Kubevert, uh, I did it with the upstream operators. 
Um, I know they're on our wish list. Where, okay, so Kubert would be the CNV equivalent. Yeah, yeah. Kubert is the is, is the container native virtualization upstream. Mm -hmm. And for service mesh, you have a lot of different possibilities. But I mean, I'm doing the up the uh, upstream of Istio, not the operator from Operator Hub. But I mean, they're good. I mean, they work. Yeah, Maestra Service Mesh. That uh, it, it's the it, it's community provided operator it's a community supported operator provided by red hat that that is in the operator hub for 4.7 i just confirmed awesome okay it's maestro cool. maestro service mesh yeah um and so uh so people know some terminology we know a lot of names here so one of the things that we do at red hat is we try to give the open source community supported version a different name from the Red Hat subscription version so that people don't get confused. Um, and so for OpenShift Service Mesh, that name is Maestra, which is Istio plus the management tools and UI and stuff that we've developed to make Istio easier to use. I'm not um, sure that that keeps it less confusing or not, but um, <laughs> it does keep them separate in terms of support uh, availability. So I think that's really the key here. I, yeah, I, I tend to think it just makes everything so confusing. Um, and we do have um, a catalog for operators for um, uh, for OKD. Uh, so if you go into the repo and, and follow the, the, the links there, you can find that. And we're working on getting making sure we have equivalency with OCP um, and that they're all tested. Um, by the community. So that's, that's um, one thing. And the thing that I would say is we also um, are really looking for uh, community participation in updating our docs. So if you're looking at our guides or um, at docs.okd.io and you find something that's um, out of whack or not quite clear enough, um, log an issue. Um, we definitely um, will take any, even grammar checking um, helps us and um, and we really have had a great swell of testers from on all kinds of implementations and deployments of um, of OKD and it's really helped a lot driving innovation and getting um, OCP and uh, the up the the product itself very stable. So it, it's really the engineers at Red Hat have been incredibly supportive of the OKD community and you know shout out to Fadim and Christian and you know, Timothy and other folks who have really, um, you know, a lot of their spare time, um, weekends and others getting releases out and helping the community move things forward. So we're incredibly grateful for that support too. But this is really a very community driven effort. Um, and uh, it's, you know, any and all feedback. And if you have some strange, interesting contortion of a stack that you want to write a guide about, or if you have an alternative to one of the routers we've been using or a different way of doing DNS, just um, hit us up um, in the, the working group forum on Google or in the Kubernetes Slack on OpenShift-Dev. We're all hanging out there most of the time. And um, we're pretty global um, in our coverage. So um, there's usually someone on all the time. Or at least someone gets woken up, so. Um. Speaking of community support, so we have a, a highly technical question um, in the uh, streaming chat. I don't know if any of you guys are actually logged into the streaming chat. Um, if not, we might want to recommend that he actually take that somewhere else because this is this is not something I even read aloud. It has network errors and stuff in it. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah. I, and and definitely looks like an occasion for community troubleshooting. Um, I would say if the person could take that to the channel or the email list that we have, the, the Kubernetes-based uh, 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 Slack channel that we have, um, uh, OpenShift-Dev on the Kubernetes Slack server, uh, or our email list, either one of those, then we can uh, take a look at it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We try to avoid doing troubleshooting um, at that level during office hours, because sometimes that means bouncing around documentation and and things like that, but we're happy to help for sure. Okay. Um, uh, more feature questions. Um, uh, is there a way to do Windows containers um, with OKD? Uh, 
does container support? I, I think so. I it's it's yeah, I thought that I thought that started with four seven. Yeah. I would be wrong. I don't yeah. think anybody yeah. preview. Yeah. Um, in the OKD working group, I haven't seen anyone's head pop up saying it, but it is compatible with what's available to do in an OCP. So theoretically, it should just work along with the same lines as the OCP documentation on it. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if it's supported with UPI, but uh, it should be supported on IPI installations. Yeah, the, the, the operator is available in the operator hub. It's called the Communities Window Machine Config Operator. To, to enable Windows container workloads. I, I haven't tried it yet, uh, but I can confirm that the operator is there. Give it a shot and let us know. Yeah. <laughs> That's really the I'll have, to, I'll have to find a Windows workload to try to run. Right. So, so that's the thing is .NET code for me. <laughs> when we get questions like this, um, where maybe none of us currently in the group have experience with it, and this isn't everyone in the working group, um, but if we don't have experience, if there is a someone out there in the world who's asking us, if you could try it if, and, and let us know how it goes, that would be awesome because then we can write up some documentation. We could point to your use case, uh, et cetera. So feel free to join us and, and help us uh, hash out the details of that. Cube word. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more suited, I think. We, we also get these questions uh, about Windows containers all the time. And I always recommend Cube word because Cube word, I think, is, yeah, it's a VM running in in your Kubernetes cluster, and you can run any Windows version you, you like. And I think it's more capable for migration scenarios, at least, than yeah. Windows yeah. containers, because you can't, can't pack anything in Windows uh, containers. Yeah, so, one of the things I really wondered about Windows containers is where are people getting images from? Right. Because obviously, too. you can't use a Linux container image to create a Windows container. No, we are different ones. Sure. You have to does, build them on your own. Yeah. Does Code Ready workspaces work on OKD or is there an upstream operator version? Uh yes. It's uh Eclipse Che. That there yeah. is an there is an operator um for, for Eclipse Che. Cool. So yeah, um, it's not exactly code ready workspaces, but it's the upstream of code ready workspaces, Eclipse Che, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we also have support for uh, OKD-based um, code-ready containers, like single-node development versions of, uh, of OKD. Awesome. Did we get all the questions? questions out there? Yeah. I'm looking back. Let's see. If not, um, one one of the things I want to say is is as someone who's been playing with since the early days of origin in OKD, I am really grateful to all the folks who are on this call and all the other folks in the OKD working group um, that are community members who have come and given their feedback over the years and really encourage everybody. Um, since it's open source, we don't know that you're out there. It's not gated, we have no clue who you are. So if you raise up your hand and, and, and join the OKD working group, um, we'd love to have you there. Um, and ask your questions again in the Kubernetes Slack um, in OpenShift-Dev. And this has been um, one of the most wonderful and rewarding groups of people to work with over the past few years. It's really grown exponentially. Um, and you know the, the feedback we've gotten and the testing and the deployment um, marathon we did uh, a year ago and then another OKD testing and deployment workshop, we're all community driven. If you go to OpenShift's um, YouTube channel, which is, I think, youtube.com. RH OpenShift. Yeah. RH OpenShift. Yep. There's a whole playlist of um, videos of people walking through deployments for OKD. And they're really great. And the guides are a great supplement to those. And we really are looking for, you know, I keep saying it, other permutations of how you want to deploy OKD and that, and um, just stretching the edges of where um, OpenShift lives and breathes out there. So please do join us. Um, we're really um, one of the most receptive and inclusive groups of folks. There's no silly questions, only silly walks. Um, never walk alone, walk with the OKD, OKD working group. Nice.
Well, we haven't anybody... designated a minister yet, though, for the silly walks. Okay. So that could be you. New contributor roles available. Yeah. Uh, and anyone else have any other closing thoughts for this session? It's office hour session. Just wanted to say thanks uh, for having us on here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Josh. And this has been, um, it's always great to be able to tell people what we're working on and to bring more people into the fold. So very much appreciated. Well, thank you for coming on. We really Thanks, everybody. It. And thanks for all the questions. Um, hopefully we answered them for you. And if not, you can follow up in the community. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you very Take much. Take care, all. Bye.